Buckle up, people. It's federal election time. You've got one vote. How are you going to decide who to vote for? From Hope Media, How in God's Name Should I Vote is a podcast looking at how and why Christians interact with the political process. But don't worry, this is a campaign-free zone. We're not going to tell you who to vote for, but we are going to dig deep into how following Jesus might impact your vote. Today we're thinking beyond our vote. If we genuinely believe in a democratic process, it doesn't end with you, a pencil and a half-cooked sausage plus onion on May the 18th. In this episode, we're looking at ways to make a difference and continue the conversation after the election is done and dusted. Specifically featured today among many guests is an extended conversation with Carolyn Kitto from Stop the Traffic relating to her role in the Modern Slavery Bill, which illustrates the people power necessary to move governments. It's actually a sign that our politicians realise that our society is diverse and that people do want to have an opinion. OK, I can I can chain myself to a gate for an afternoon. And I, I wish more Christians would, frankly. I would encourage people by taking steps. It depends where you are on the journey, but there are always steps where you can just dip your toe in. That's all coming up in this fifth episode of How in God's Name Should I Vote? You might think that political action isn't for you, that it's just something that other people do, you know, people with long hair, no shoes and poor personal hygiene. Maybe you don't think you're passionate enough to wave a placard or radical enough to attend a rally. The whole idea of standing shoulder to shoulder with someone who you likely disagree with on just about everything else is unnerving. And maybe you don't think Christians should ever do this because, you know, the Bible. Jim Wallace, founder of Sojourners, would disagree. I asked Jim about the place of political action in the life of a Christian. I believe in the kingdom of God and that to stand for that, to speak for that, to write for that, to protest for that, to run for office with that. Somebody asked me just today, it's funny, how many times have you been arrested? I, I had to figure it out 25 times I've been arrested, but I've also been inside the White House, and I'm over the Senate and the House all the time talking to people there. So it's inside, outside. Most movements, it's an inside, outside strategy. Martin Luther King Jr., my mentor, built a movement on the outside, but then he also worked the inside, and you've got to do both at the same time. So sometimes protests, sometimes lobbying, sometimes advocating, sometimes organizing, sometimes personally talking to people with political power about their faith. I do that all the time. We've got to be bold and imaginative and creative and Particularly young people are finding new ways using the social media they know so well to change narratives, change conversations. Politics doesn't change until conversations do, until cultures do. So how do we change the mindset? How do we change the hearts and minds of people? Particularly if they say they're followers of Jesus, we say, okay, Jesus said leadership is who is the greatest, those who are willing to serve and wash each other's feet. So, all we have to do is change the culture, right? Doesn't seem too big an ask. But seriously, just like that incredible protest song from Paul Kelly and Kev Carmody from Little Things, Big Things Grow. Joe Knight is the National Advocacy Coordinator for Tear Australia. She says getting started in political action is easy. Yes, I would encourage people by taking steps. It depends where you are on the journey, but there are always steps where you can just dip your toe in. Um, And it might be something like going to the local newsagent and buying a card or making a handwritten card and writing a note to your politician. Not an email, take a little bit of effort and do something in handwriting. Send them a note and say, you know, congratulations, you know, I see you're newly elected, I'm in your local community and I'm praying for you. And make sure you are actually praying for them. Urge them to use their position for good, that they would govern with wisdom. 
that they would ensure that they're making decisions that help those living in poverty. Communicate that you're a Christian, that you care about issues of global poverty. Uh, it's really important to begin that engagement. For others, you know, they might be more used to engaging with politicians and they're happy to sort of cultivate over time a relationship, whether that's once or twice a year and having a meeting in their electoral office, taking along a small group of people from your church or your small group, inviting politicians to some events at your church where they might share with your broader church community. There are different ways you can do it. Um, it might take you a little bit out of your comfort zone, but there are still are steps you can do. You know, we see that the big shifts in history where the church has often had a real lead in bringing policies of justice and change have been when ordinary people have taken those consistent steps where they've started to live lives that are different, that they have called on change for the powerful. And that's where you start to see movements for change. And, and when we start to really see that growing body of you know thousands of Australian Christians starting to make those sort of long lasting changes, both having the integrity in their own lifestyles of what they might be doing, but also having the courage to take that step of speaking up to those in power, to see that as part of our everyday life and expression as the body of Christ in this country, we can be an enormous uh, force for change and for good. Of course, our form of political action will largely depend on the things we decide to take action about. Brad Chilcott, founder of Welcome to Australia, says Christians need to be inclusive in the way they approach political action. There's a backlash against Christians using their power to exclude and demonise and hate people. <laughs> and I think rightfully so. It's true that there should be, of course, freedom of belief and freedom of religion. But where you try and impose that belief that you have onto public legislation that then excludes citizens of a nation from the rights that every other human being in that nation has... Of course, there is a backlash against that. And so I hope that the future of Christian engagement in politics in Australia is on the side of the marginalised and the excluded and the oppressed. I hope that Christians are on the side of those who miss out on the benefits of the prosperity that we have in this nation, rather than the Christian engagement being on the side of maintaining their own power, privilege and desire to impose their particular view of morality on the rest of society. Someone who is no stranger to public action and political engagement is Michael Frost. I asked Mike about civil disobedience and the times he's taken dramatic action to promote a good cause and how he responds to the veiled criticism that direct action is more about media attention than anything else. <laughs> Yes, it is. Civil disobedience is about media attention. It's about doing something that gets uh, media attention so that people become more aware of the issue. So in short, yes. Why did I do it? Well, it depends on which instance we're talking about. But on one occasion, it was as a result of reading the Nauru papers and just hearing for the first time the unspeakable suffering that was going on on that island. I had a visceral reaction to it. My taxes are being paid to fund this torture. So... I was infuriated and thought, well, how on earth can we make a difference? And at some point, you know, you've been in enough marches and you've visited your local member enough and you've put up posters or placards or made Facebook posts or whatever enough, you think, well, what's the next iteration of this? For the kids at the climate strike, it's, well, let's march in the streets. But if things don't change, well, what's next? What's next? What's next? There's always going to be something else uh, unless some kind of change occurs. And praise God, the, those kids are now off Nauru. I mean, there are still people in offshore detention, but thank God that the kids have been released from Nauru. But, you know, civil disobedience is exactly that. It's about trying to gain attention. And when I was chained to the gates of Kirribilli House uh, next to a guy called uh, Jared McKenna, after the last time I'd been arrested at the Prime Minister's office not achieving anything, I said to him, it was a baking hot day and I'm chained by my throat to a gate and there's police and media everywhere. And I said, what difference does this make anyway, Jared? And he grabbed his phone and passed it over to me. And he said, here's a, a tweet from some guys on Manus right now. And the tweet was, you know, it doesn't matter what this achieves, guys. Just knowing that you are with us just means the world to us. And I thought, well, if that's all this does, 
if it just gives some courage and some strength to some people who are like suffering really unspeakable hopelessness okay i can i can chain myself to a gate for an afternoon and i, I wish more christians would frankly is there a line that we can't cross as christians in terms of civil disobedience well, I think a better term for civil disobedience is non-violent direct action. So the direct action part is you put yourself in a place where authorities want you not to be. So I was in the Prime Minister's office. They didn't want me to be there. It was a direct action to sit in there. It was a direct action to get chained to the gates of Kirribilli House. So Martin Luther King marched on the streets, rode buses when they were segregated, sat at lunch counters where they were segregated. So that was the direct action. It's against the law for me as a black man to have lunch at this counter. I'm going to sit at the counter anyway. Uh, it's against the law for me to be chained to a gate. It's a gate that the Prime Minister might want to drive in and out of. So it happens the Prime Minister didn't live in that house, currently still doesn't live in that house. But anyway, I am actually uh, you know, impeding access to the house. So that's the direct action part of it. The non-violent part is really important. So we don't commit vandalism. We don't attack people. We're not violent. It's a non-violent direct action. So sitting at a lunch counter, uh, doing a sit-in somewhere, marching in the the street without a permit, as the case would be with Martin Luther King and uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, they are absolutely passive forms of resistance. So when the police come and ask us to move, we say that we won't move. That's the the passive part of it. But when we're arrested, we assent. We we uh, we go with them. So. So no, I wouldn't be going around smashing windows or rioting or hurting people or breaking laws of that kind. But nonviolent direct action in order to bring attention to a particular issue is actually an ancient Christian tradition. It doesn't go back as far as uh, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. It goes right back to um, Christian activism before the Russian Revolution. You find nonviolent direct action uh, by the Dutch during the, the rise of the Nazis. It's uh, an old and traditional traditional way of responding to a government that doesn't appear to be listening to us, either at the polling booth or through more traditional forms of, uh, of protest. I'm paraphrasing, but the most famous evangelical preacher in history, Billy Graham, said that courage is contagious. When someone brave takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. And there really are heaps of inspiring examples of Christians making a difference through political engagement for the good of others. Vicki Howarth is part of a delegation from MICA Australia who've spent time in Canberra lobbying for justice. I'm part of, as you said, MICA Australia. And every year we run an event called Voices for Justice. And that's an event where we take a couple, we invite people from across Australia, everyday Christians, to come and join us for four days down in Canberra. And the first couple of days are actually spent in training with aid and development organisations um, and prayer and worship. And then we spend two days actually going into Parliament House to meet with politicians and to advocate for the world's poor and vulnerable and oppressed. Last year, we actually had over a hundred meetings take place. And this was, you know, high school students, parents, missionaries, pastors, young professionals, and more. And the encouraging thing for me, Andrew, is the politicians who meet with us actually say to us, you must keep on doing what you're doing because you're doing something that other people don't do when they come down to Parliament House. You're advocating for the needs of others and not just for yourselves. And I think that it does get impact. I mean, I was reading an article just from Wednesday from a Labour senator for Tasmania, Lisa Singh, and she was 
encouraging Australia to do more. They said, you know, the members of Micro Australia said we needed to be doing more for Australian aid. And I agree, it's not just good enough. And because of the meetings we've been having with her and many other politicians, she was advocating for an increase in aid spend because not only does it make sense, but it makes sense for building better infrastructure for our security. And she started talking about the great work that aid has done. And she ended her article saying, I agree with the people from Mike Australia. Increasing Australia's foreign aid contributions isn't only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. So I think we have to look at where we can get those those wins. And when I think about what makes good political engagement, going back to my PR days, I think the advice I'd always give a client is be really clear about who you're trying to reach. And sometimes there's low hanging fruit, there's politicians who are on side and you can work with them. And sometimes you, your job's harder. And then the other thing is, how are you going to reach them? Is it direct engagement or is it through community engagement? And what are you going to say? And that's where the messaging has to be really, really clear. You see, that whole messaging thing is just vital. Too often we Christians haven't really worked out what we want to say and why we want to say it. And so we can come across as reactionary and sometimes even self-serving. Melinda tankard Reist is one of the founders of Collective Shout, a grassroots movement pushing back against objectification of women and the sexualisation of girls. She spoke with Katrina Rowe about engaging political leaders and some of the wins she's been a part of. Yes, look, we've had a great year so far, Katrina. We had a major win with getting Air Asia to remove sexually exploitative ads. They had a slogan that said, get off in Thailand, uh, an obvious meaning there, encouraging sex Mm. tourism where men go and use some of the most exploited and marginalised women and girls in the world. Mariner Watches had uh, ads depicting uh, women having alcohol poured down their throat and being choked at the same time. We got a significant apology uh, from that company. We had a deeply disturbing game called Rape Day pulled from the biggest gaming platform uh, in the world called Steam. Uh, I don't even know if you wanted me to go into the details about this game. And then we also had the Australian government announce that there would be no visas given to anyone convicted of violent crimes against women and children. So four in a row pretty encouraging for our supporters. Yeah, that is fantastic. And look, you've had a lot of successes. You've obviously learned a lot in your years as an advocate and an activist. So Mm. what can you share with us about how to do this stuff well? Well, the first thing is to speak out. Just do it. We have a, a right to have a say. Don't walk away. Don't ignore what you're seeing. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And it's because Uh, too many people have walked away that we've ended up with this mess. We have to keep up the pressure. Uh, We need to be willing to take that risk, to speak out, to make ourselves uh, unpopular, to potentially even lose friends if we are going to see any shift at all. Are there things that you could pass on to people who might want to be, you know, politically active in general about what are the ways that they can be most effective in doing it? Because I think sometimes we work against our own cause. We have to be uh, willing to take these issues up with our governments and our regulatory bodies. Obviously, we're in electioneering right now. This is a great time to contact uh, your candidate and let them know what you think. We need to contact our elected MPs uh, post-election. You know, these these issues are going to continue regardless of of who gets government, of who wins government. So, you know, our governments and our regulatory bodies have failed us. Again, raise it, call it out, make an appointment with your MP, call them, email them. There's so many ways to engage uh, with them, but they won't act if they don't believe there is a constituency for change. So be part of that constituency for change and do something. 
Now, this may come as a surprise, but in the last 12 months, legislation has been presented in both the Federal Parliament and the State Parliament of New South Wales relating to modern slavery, specifically laws around developing supply chain transparency for large production companies. Both bills were debated and both bills were passed into law. Stop the Traffic is a coalition of organisations who oppose modern slavery and they were one of the key influences behind the bill. By any measure, it has been a phenomenally successful example of Christians growing an extraordinary movement for the common good. I asked Stop the Traffic's director, Carolyn Kitto, how they made it happen. Our main connection with slavery is through the products that we buy. It's the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the electronics that we use every day, all the backbone of slavery that confronts us here. And we were working with business to make changes. And I guess one of the things that we've always said is it's actually easier to work with business than it is to work with politicians because in a business, somebody can make a decision and they can implement it within 10 to 100 days. In politics, it takes a lot longer. But what we also realised in politics was that if we could have laws in Australia that governed the way that business supply chains operate, the impact of that would be far more than our capacity to work with businesses one by one. So back in 2011, we started campaigning we started sending postcards to successive attorneys general, of which there were a multitude from many sides, slowly visited politicians, had conversations, and the conversation started out as, you know, don't be ridiculous. Nobody's ever going to agree to this, which is probably what they said to William Wilberforce too, so maybe we were in reasonable company. But then it started to gather some momentum. The UK put an act in and then it was announced that there would be an inquiry. One of the key important things in the process of engaging Australia's political process is, first of all, to be incredibly grateful that we have it. There are so many countries in the world where we don't have a democratic or a political process that you can engage. I remember on the day that the bill was going to be passed through the House of Reps, and I'd been talking to one of our volunteers the day before whose husband comes from an overseas country. He had been really concerned that if she was involved with an organisation that was talking to politicians, that would be dangerous. And here we were walking up the hill to walk into our parliament to watch our senators and representatives discuss an issue that was important to us. You know, I actually teared up. You know, we are so fortunate to have this country and this way of operating. What was important for us is to work with a broad range of people to try and get some consensus over some important things that needed to be in the Act. So in the end, we had 43 NGOs that had agreed, not on everything, but on what the main asks were. So we were then able to talk to both the major parties, we were able to talk to the minor parties, we were able to talk to the independents, and we were able to say, this is what we think will work. Now, we didn't get everything that we wanted, but we got the majority of what we wanted. And in the end, what was important was that the Act was passed and then it could be improved later. It's an astonishingly long game. Oh, that yes. You've had to play. <laughs> yes, 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 it is. It is. And we were in an event with a bunch of young people, and somebody said, You know, how long have you been at this? And I said, Oh, well, on this issue, eight years. And they kind of, you know, <laughs> couldn't believe that it took that long. However, when a whole society is cause to focus on an issue, that's when you get a deep culture change. And that's what we need in our world today to address modern slavery. I think the idea for most people in the West around slavery is that it is an ancient practice and largely unknown or possibly non-existent mm. within our modern day world. Yeah. That's clearly untrue. Absolutely. And um, 
most people's image still is of people in chains and the reality is that most people who um, are enslaved aren't in physical chains or their image is something like, you know, Liam Neeson in Taken. So most people who are now enslaved, it's estimated, and let me put a little footnote here, nobody really knows. That's one of the reasons why if you start to get interested in modern slavery, you will actually find that the figures are all different. It's an illegal, organised crime, which is very underground. Human traffickers don't put out resumes that say, you know, position wanted human trafficker, and they don't fill in tax <laughs> forms. So, mm. so they're pretty hard to they're pretty hard to track. But the estimations are that there is at least forty million in the world today. The majority of them are in the supply chains of business, probably two thirds to three quarters, and the majority are in our region of the world. It's our region, <laughs> it's our products. It's our businesses and it's our responsibility. Your campaign is a remarkable story about successful political activism. Mm. Mm. We don't always get success stories. Yeah. What have you learnt about, firstly, the political system itself, then the political process and how to be an effective lobbyist? Has that been a journey for you? Oh, absolutely. I found out so much. (laughs) Let me give you one little secret. The different parties don't receive each other's press releases, for example. You kind of assume if a press release goes out from a party that the other party reads it and they know what's going on. Pretty quickly discovered that's not the case. So if you want one party to know what another party is saying or thinking, you have to tell them. And they kind of expect that you will. (laughs) So, you know, really simple things that you would assume are logical things that will happen don't necessarily happen. We learned patience and we learned that Most of the process that happens actually happens behind the scenes, not in plain sight. We also learnt that some of the best people that you can meet with and talk to are not necessarily the politicians themselves, but are their staff people. They have more time, they probably have deeper knowledge, and they're the ones that advise. You know, some people think if you get a meeting with a minister, then you've had a success I don't think that was the Jesus way. He met with the little people. And so if you're happy to go and meet with the little people first off, you'll build yourself a reputation that will allow you to get further up the supply chain, so to speak. I guess we've also learnt that the process is there to be engaged. So when an inquiry is called, anyone in Australia can make a submission to an inquiry. Anyone can write to their local politician and ask for their politician to suggest an inquiry. So there's a whole process that we can all be involved in that is very open and transparent. And I think as politics has progressed, particularly over the last decade, what we've seen is with more and more inquiries and royal commissions, it's actually a sign that our politicians realise that our society is diverse and that people do want to have an opinion. If there's one thing that has become abundantly clear through this podcast series, it's that being an engaged citizen doesn't end after you've ticked the box and wolfed down your sausage sanger. If that's your take home, go back to the start and listen again, many times. Good political engagement is ongoing. It takes time and energy and thought. It absolutely means at times being uncomfortable. It means standing up and speaking with respect. And you know it's an enormous privilege that we can do it all without ending up in jail or worse. These freedoms are by no means universal. We are exceptionally fortunate to live in the kind of civil society that enshrines the right to disagree in law. Despite the chatter around freedom of speech currently on the boil in our country, the very fact we are discussing it proves the point. Finally, it's a chance to show the depth of Christian thought and Christian faith, that following Jesus means loving our neighbour more than ourselves, that we live not to further our own interests, but to love all people everywhere. Amen to that.
If you've enjoyed How in God's Name Should I Vote, you might like to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks so much for coming on this journey with us. It's our sincere hope this podcast will help you both in the polling booth and in your broader life as you consider your involvement in our democracy. Oh, and keep an eye out for bonus content in the coming weeks, including a bunch of full-length interviews. Brooke Prentice shares on the reality of life in Australia today as an Aboriginal person. Mike Frost dives into the progressive conservative divide and encourages a third way. John Dixon cajoles us to engage our culture and our politics with open hearts and open minds. Carolyn Kitto shares the inspiring story of how few people prepared to do the really hard work of building coalition can change Australian law and the lives of millions of the global poor. Max Jeganathan shares on his experiences as a refugee, a political advisor and today a Christian apologist. And Jim Wallace, a personal hero of mine, helps us get our heads around the reality of geopolitics and how everyday followers of Jesus can be culture changers. It's inspiring stuff. So that's a wrap, folks. I'm Andrew Palmer, and it's been my great pleasure to host this series of How in God's Name Should I Vote? Thanks to our producers, Katrina Rowe and Liam Denny, and our online content manager, Andrew Morris. Production by Richard Hamwee.